Hello again, everyone. I'm Joe Longinusa, welcoming you to another edition of Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, the show where industry leaders, golf professionals, and legends all come and discuss the great game we love so much. So without further ado, let's turn it over to our host to tell us who's next on the tee. Chris, take it away. Hey, thank you, Joe. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for being with me this morning on Next on the Tee. I am your host, Chris Mascaro, and today I have two great guests to share with you. First up is going to be 2003 PGA champion Sean McKeel. Sean has become a great friend of the show over the last, you know, year, year and a half. I'm, you know, I'm sure you all remember that uh, that great shot, the great seven iron that he hit uh, back on the 18th hole at Oak Hill in the 2003 PGA Championship. Probably the best seven iron shot in, in the history of golf. But did you also know Sean is only the second golfer to make a double eagle in U.S. Open history? He did it on the sixth hole at Pebble Beach back in 2010. What did it feel like to hit both of those shots? Well, we're going to find out when Sean joins us here in just a few moments. Following Sean is another PGA Tour veteran, Kenny Knox. Kenny won three times on the PGA Tour from 1986 to 1990. And overall, Kenny had 26 top 10 finishes, including a fourth place finish at the 1991 PGA Championship. Speaking of great PGA uh, Championship uh, history, he runs his own company now called Kenny Knox Golf. We'll chat all about Kenny's career when he joins me about 20 minutes from now. So it's going to be a great show. I am so glad that you're here to take the journey with me over the next hour. Next on the tee is brought to you uh, today by Seymour Putters. Let's hear a word from Joe LaGenusa about our great friends over at Seymour Putters. Golfers, has this happened to you? Great drive. Perfect second shot on the green. Only the three or even four putts shaking your head all the way back to the cart. I have good news. Help is on the way with the Seymour Putter. The Seymour Putter Company patented RST technology sets up the putter perfectly every time using a visible gun sight on the top line. Genius. It's like locking radar onto the target, in this case, the golf hole, putting the golfer in perfect position to make a reliable and consistent stroke. The 1999 U.S. Open and 2007 Masters Champions both use, you guessed it, the Seymour Putter. So if you're ready to make more putts and take strokes off your game, log on to Seymour.com. That's S-E-E-M-O-R-E.com and put a Seymour Putter in your bag today. Like Joe said, check out the rifle scope technology that helped win two majors and 35 tour events so far. And if, uh, you know, if you need help making more putts, it's absolutely going to help you. I know it's helping me. Check them out online at Seymour.com. That's S-E-E-M-O-R-E.com. We're also brought to you today by our good friends over at GolfBalls.com. If you're looking for a great gift idea for Dad this Father's Day, check out the wide variety of gift options at GolfBalls.com. Get Dad's name, his initials, or favorite saying printed on his favorite brand of golf balls or on some tees. Or how about personalizing a hat for him or a towel? Make Dad's Day special and memorable with personalized golf items from GolfBalls.com. GolfBalls.com is the online leader in golf customization. I want to kick off today's show like we do every single week here on Next on the Tee by saluting the brave men and women serving in our military. We want to thank all of you for your daily sacrifices and for what you do every day to keep the rest of us safe. We also want to thank our veterans for all you've done for us over the years. We truly appreciate everything you do to preserve our freedoms and our liberties. It's through our military strength and your efforts that our way of life is even possible. Our sincere thanks as well to Sean Cruz and all the wonderful folks over at the Armed Forces Radio Network. It's an honor for us to have our show be a part of your network. You can find us by going to armedforcesradionetwork.org. I also want to let our veterans know, be sure to check out globalvoiceforveterans.org. It's a great site with news and articles and a wealth of information designed specifically for our veterans that I'm sure that you're going to find both interesting and beneficial. Again, globalvoiceforveterans.org. 
We also want to thank everyone listening in across the Internet on great sites like iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, and Blog Talk Radio as well. Plus, if someone's dragging you to the mall or to the grocery store or you're just tired of the same old, same old on your commute, download the Player.fm or Stitcher app on your smartphone and take us with you everywhere you go. Let us give you something fun to focus on while you're out and about. All right, now joining me on the Seymour Putters guest line is Sean McKeel. Let me remind you quickly about Sean's background. He's originally from Orlando, Florida, later moved on to Memphis, Tennessee. Why? Because his father's one of the original pilots for FedEx. He attended the same high school as I did, Christian Brothers. We're a few years apart. I'll let your imagination uh, try to figure out which one of us is older than the other. He played collegiately at Indiana University, turned pro back in 1992, he won once on the Nike Tour, what's now the Web.com Tour, at the Greensboro Open in 1999. The year prior, he won internationally at the Singapore Open. We all remember his fantastic win at the 2003 PGA Championship at Oak Hill with perhaps the greatest seven-iron shot in the history of golf. It's certainly the greatest shot on the 72nd hole at a major championship in golf history. On top of that, PGA Championship, he's got 20 top 10 finishes and 57 top 25s. Plus, he's a heck of a great guy, and I am thrilled to have him back and next on the tee with me this morning. Good morning, Sean. How are you, my friend? Chris, good morning. How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you. Sean, you got, you've gotten so far this year, you've gotten to play one event. You played back at the uh, Puerto Rican Open back in March. You made the cut, finished even par. How come I'm not seeing you in more events? Well, I think it's just, uh, you know, the way the process of you know, the tour has changed a lot of the qualifications qualification the way that the way that guys uh you know have access to the tour and there are a lot of members you know um you know the last year or two i've i've decided you know try to stick with really one one tour and i um you know that was really going to be the web.com tour i went to the web.com tour qualifying school last year and i didn't make it through had some really really bad weather but um i've done a couple qualifiers this year and just did the one event it's just difficult to get into tournaments and uh the qualifying process is you know on mondays is is really difficult you know 150 160 guys for four spots so i've just not really been too motivated to do a lot of that stuff and uh consequently i you haven't seen me playing and 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 to your point and that's and i think that's something that we all don't know enough about golf fans don't know enough enough about is the tour process what do you, you know, for a guy who's a major champion, and like I, you know, said in your intro, I mean, you, you, you've been, you know, near or at the top of the leaderboard several times throughout the course of your career, 57 top 25s. Talk about what is the qualifying process like now, and why isn't it different for somebody who has the resume that you have? Well, you know, I mean, Kenny, Kenny will be able to speak to this as well because he, he came in, and I think at a time where they had, um, you know, only maybe 50 or 60 exempt players, and that probably changed them at the early 80s, maybe 1980, 81, something like that. Um, you know, when I first came onto the PJ Tour, there was a qualifying process, a qualifying tournament, and mm-hmm. there were three stages. It was a first stage, you know, that was usually in, in October, then there was one in November, and then if you made it, um, you know, they take 40 or 50 guys the first one, and it would take 20, 25 guys the next one, and then they all met. We all met in California if you made it that far. And uh, you basically played for 50 cards plus ties. So my first experience of getting onto the PJ Tour came in, well, that was 1994, but December of 1993, I'd made it to the finals. Uh, I think I had won the second stage in, at, at Bear Lakes in West Palm Beach. And, and it was, what was great about it was that my father was caddying for me. Um, so I head out to Palm Springs. This is probably wow. my second, second or third qualifying tournament. So I make it to the finals. Which was big because I was going to have access at least onto the to the Ben Hogan Tour, which was another avenue to get to get playing privileges on the PJ Tour. And you know, like I played, and you know, my dad and I were just enjoying our time out there. My my family, my mom was out there. My sister came out, um, had some friends come out to watch me play. Well, I get to I think the uh, I guess the fifth round wasn't a very good round for me. So it looked like I was going to be a, a Web dot com or a, you know we'll call it the Web dot com tour now. And I shoot 67 the last day, and I get my PJ Tour card, and um, so that's really kind of how I became part of the PJ Tour. And I didn't play very well the first couple times that I played. I was still kind of finding my way, and 
um, you know, it was difficult learning new golf courses and, and things like that. And, of course, I didn't have a whole lot of friends on the PJ Tour at the time because, you know, most of the guys that I played with, they either gave up professional golf and, and started families or was just doing something else, you know, or there were just guys I just didn't know. Like I said, I was just out of college a couple of years, so I didn't really know a whole lot of people. So it was that, that part was difficult for me. Um, but, you know, now it's just, it's, it's difficult. There is a, there's a web.com qualifying and, um, and that's it. And there's no more PJ tour qualifying school. So everybody that comes onto the PJ tour either gets access to the world rankings, uh, sponsors exemptions, or they're already exempt or Monday qualified. So the, 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 those lists of exemption categories have been narrowed down uh, significantly. Yeah. And to, the, and to that point, you know, Sean, it's, it's interesting to me because, uh, Q school was something, you know, that was so, so much a part of the tour forever. And, you know, and, and I've talked to several guys on, on the show, Sean, that, you know, talk about the, the pressure of getting through Q school was almost uh, more difficult and uh, harder to deal with than the, you know, pressure out being out on tour week in and week out. But what, what happened to the Q school process? Well, you know, why, what, do you have an idea of why that went away? Well, I think that, that uh, the powers that be down there in Jacksonville decided that, the, the guys that come off the web.com tour um, maybe played a little bit more consistently, a little better, and were better prepared to handle the life on the PJ tour. That's part of it. I think the other part, and maybe this plays more of a, a role, is that they were looking for a way to bolster the web.com tour. If you look back at the history, go back to when the Ben Hogan tour started, there have been numerous sponsors of of that I'm, a, I'm not. I guess I'll call it the secondary tour because it's really a lot of great former tour players there. Um, right. The secondary PJ tour, but you know we've had a lot of sponsors that have that have you know there's Buy.com, there's been Web.com, you know there's there's been a couple others, um, you know, and it's just uh, I think it was a way for them to to keep to keep interest in that tour. Uh, the tour does fund a lot of it, and I know that, that each of the events is responsible for itself. Um, you know, it's difficult to raise money in these in these days, and uh, so some tournaments have kind of come and gone. But right. you know, they just decided that that the Q School process really wasn't a way they wanted to have guys get out on the PJ Tour, and um, you know, they're going to stand by saying that the guys are better prepared. I don't always believe that because a lot of the guys that have played the PJ Tour end up having to go back to Q School, did get their card back. Um, right. So I don't necessarily believe in that uh, philosophy, but, but that's that's what they've sold to, to everybody. And, um, you know, they're the ones that make the decisions. And as players, you just kind of follow their lead and, um, and, and just play to the best of your ability. But, um, you know, that, that's – you know, they upset a lot of people, you know, doing that. The younger players don't really, you know, they haven't really experienced um, both the Q school and, you know, not having the Q school. So I think for old old veteran players like me, you know, you get tired of change and don't really accept it as well. But maybe in the, in the end it's going to be better for the tour. Who knows? Now, one of the things that uh, you actually turned me on to is sort of this bridge tour, if you will, uh, for guys, you know, in the – you know, late 40s, you know, kind of, you know, maybe winding down on the PGA Tour, waiting for the opportunity to get out on the Champions Tour. Uh, we've got uh, Don Barnes joining us next yeah. week to kind of kind of walk us through it. But uh, for for uh, those who are like me who are who aren't aware of the tour, uh, you know, uh, that uh, you know, I guess is building this bridge. Talk about uh, how you found out about it, and uh, you know where you might end up uh, potentially playing out there. Yeah, you know, I, I stumbled across it. I don't know if it was on Facebook or Twitter. I mean, you know, I think in my golf circles, I'm still, you know, my brain is still wrapped around the PJ Tour, and that's still where I feel like I need to be. Um, and so I was reading about it, and I and I sent Don as a quick note. And I said, hey, you know, I think what you're doing is incredible. I don't know if people just don't know about it, um, you know, because many of the guys that are going to go on to the champions tour at age 50 are still competitive out there on, on, on the regular tour. And I think maybe this was a way to kind of get guys um, an opportunity to play um, events beyond what they were playing in their sections. You know, a lot of these club pros, I see it every day, you know, they, they, they don't get a chance to play as much as they used to. And so this seems to be a way 
to allow guys to still compete at a high level. And I think that's what's important about going on to the Champions Tour. So I look forward to it. I, I haven't been able to go to an event yet. Like I said, when I was down in Puerto Rico, you know, I was fully committed, you know, to playing down there. I got back and I started hearing some stuff about it. And the last thing I really wanted to do was to turn right around and go back and start, uh, you know, chasing this tour. But Don and I are, have talked, and and hopefully, um, you know, in the next little bit, I'll get a chance to uh, I get a chance to play. He just sent me something about an event that's in August, but I got to look and see at the dates because I think it coincides with the PGA Championship. So, um, you know. Just staying competitive. I think that competitive fire and the spirit never leaves. And I think with what Don's done um, to allow guys an opportunity to play and make a little bit of money, I mean, uh, is is what, what what you need. It's what you want. That that like I said, that fire never leaves. And uh, hopefully, I'll get a chance to get down there and support him. Yeah. Now, it's down in Florida, right? What do you know? What the name of the tour is uh, for folks that are you know peaking their interest, going, hey, maybe I need to take a look at this. Yeah, it's like it's like the senior circuit, you know. I I just I think it's um I know you're going to have him on. Uh um, Right, yeah, we're going to have him on next, next week, week, I think. Um, yeah, next week. You know, so I you know, I get stuff from him, you know, emails and updates and stuff like that and uh like I said, I think he's got an event coming up here. I think they're winding down kind of for the summer. And um anyway, right. but yeah. Yeah, it's the it's the Sunbelt Senior Professionals Golf Tour. Sunbelt, uh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. when he sends me emails, it just comes like the senior circuit, yeah. But um, yeah. anyway, so I think it'll be interesting, it'll be interesting to a lot of players. Yep, indeed. Sean, you, you've hit two of the greatest shots in major championship history. We've talked about your 7-iron at Oak Hill before, but I want to touch – Really, on the mental side of that, and then kind of the, and get your thoughts on the uh, on the double eagle back at Pebble Beach. But so much of golf is mental, and and uh, you know you had never been in a position to win a major championship prior to the 2003 PGA. And Chad Campbell was right there with you throughout the final round. It was you know a stroke or two, you know, throughout that whole round, you know, separated you guys. How were you able to stand over that seven iron shot on the final hole and just let it go and not get overcome by what you were about to accomplish? Well, I think, you know, a lot of it was just a buildup uh, of playing 71 holes, uh, you know, under that kind of pressure. I mean, you know, I, look, as, as you get into the round, uh, when you start with the first day, there's a lot of nerves that are kind of surrounding because, you know, you just kind of, kind of how difficult the golf courses are and how how difficult they're set up. Um, you know, so there's a process kind of getting in and, and getting to Sunday. And um, I had played very well. I was, I think confidence is probably the, uh, it's really understated and underrated. I think that, that uh, you know, people just assume that, oh, you're on the PJ Tour, you go out there, you're playing the tournaments and you're confident all the time. And that couldn't be further from the truth. It, so a lot of that, at least the last shot for me, was just a, was just a culmination of things of great things that I had done throughout the week. Um, you know, and there was also kind of this horse running to the bar and, you know, I could see the finish line. And ultimately I think I was just so sick of losing. I had let, I'd let moments like that in other tournaments. And not that they occurred really on the 18th hole or the 72nd hole. It, it, it occurred at other times during the, during the course of a tournament where I started thinking about things um, and I, and I kind of made a mistake and I, and I kind of, snowballed and I kind of lost the tournament and that happened quite a bit and I just was so sick of losing I was so sick of sick of letting the the nerves and 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 just my uh let that kind of overtake you know what I was doing and I I wasn't working with a sports psychologist of course I I read some stuff and but the one thing that I was doing so well that week is I was working well with my caddy we were conversing which I'm normally pretty quiet on the golf course. Um, I had a good pace, a good rhythm um, to my walk, to my swing. My breathing was good. I mean, all little things that you just you don't really think about. Um, everybody looks at golf. They just think of the grip, the stance, the posture, and the swing and where the ball ends up. And there's a lot of things that kind of go into uh, into that. But I just I felt great. I, I really did. I, I, don't, I wasn't nervous at all. And I, and I was – the great thing wow. about it was is that I didn't have a whole lot really in front of me really to think about other than the moment. You know, I was on the left side of the fairway. Chad was on the right side of the fairway. You know, going through the same things that you always do is getting your yardage and, um, 
you know, judging the wind, if there's any, you know, heat, there's, there's all sorts of factors. But to be honest with you, the, the, the lines of people that were down the left side and behind the green were just really a blur. I didn't, I didn't really see any of that stuff. And, um, you know, the yardage was perfect. It was 174 yards, and it was just, it was just as quickly as I could pull a seven iron out. You know, I did that, and I and I hit the ball. I stepped over it, and I hit it. And, um, you know, it just again, I think just the build up and the and the the fact that I had lost so many times, I was so sick of losing, and that's really what carried me through the last day because I I just decided that. I had enough experience with losing and how I had lost and how just kind of the nerves really affected me with poor decision-making, uh, poor club choices. You know, I was worried a lot about where not to miss it as opposed to where to hit it. So I kind of just kind of changed all of that, and and it, it, and it worked out. And, um, you know, it was definitely, as I've told you before, it, it's something that I'll never forget. I mean, I, my, my whole professional career was, was kind of centered or has been centered really around that one moment. And I think in some ways it's been a little bit unfortunate because I, I didn't, um, it's kind of like building a, a, a chocolate sundae. You know, you don't, everybody is looking for that cherry on top and that's the major to kind of solidify your career, you, you know, and I, I kind of put the cherry on the bottom, you know, you don't build a sundae <laughs> with the cherry on the bottom right. and that's what happened to me. Right. And I couldn't, I just have not been able to, to kind of summon um, you know, anything. I did well, you know, 2006 PGA, I finished second, and, and, and you right. know, Tiger won by four or five there. So, you know, but but I've had some of the great moments, but and injuries, of course, along the way. But, you know, that's kind of really how I describe is is when guys are playing for major championships. That's, the, that's what guys want. They, their careers aren't uh, fulfilled until they've won a major championship. And it's really kind of unfortunate that that was my first one because – and especially the way that I did win it with that last shot, it just was like, well, you know, kind of where do I go from here? So, um, you know, kind of a long-winded answer there, but but uh, just all part of it, really. You know, it's part of the mental yeah. process of, of getting to a win and then kind of what has followed since. Well, you know, one thing you mentioned, Sean, there about, you know, trying to, you know, you know, being angry or what what have you about, having let some other opportunities get away and you went right after this one because, you know, maybe maybe a different person, you know, looking at the situation where, you know, your playing partner who is a stroke behind you is in the middle of the fairway needing, you know, a birdie to tie you and, you know, theoretically in birdie position or opportunity to make birdie, right? And you flew, you know, dead aim at the, at the flag stick, right? So, you know, I'm yeah. two inches away, you know. So, you know, you know, and, and you know, you're a football fan. I'm a football fan, right? Maybe other opportunity, maybe other people would have in that opportunity would have, you know, just tried to get into the middle of the green, and now you're playing for four. Sort of prevent defense, if you will, right? Yeah. Make Chad come yeah. come to you, but you didn't. You went right at the flag stick. But you know, that's a mentality that maybe not everyone would have taken. So you know, this, again, walk walk me through that. You know, is that what was going through your mind? Is like, look, I'm not playing prevent defense. Here, I'm going to go win this thing. Well, and I think you play based on on how the golf course is set up. I mean, I can think of a number of holes just off the top of my head that have tougher finishing holes than say Oak Hill. You know, the the the, the Oak Hill. You know, it, it's a it's a difficult driving hole. Um, and so when I got I you know I got that part of it over with. You know, and I got up there, and the pin was what it was 13 on, and it was maybe. I'd have to go consult my yards book, but just just going from memory, it was probably 13 on and maybe eight, seven or eight from the left, maybe maybe even a couple more. So there was a little bit of a slope on the left hand side. But um, so other than just kind of the moment, there was really nothing around the green that I had to really worry about in terms of hazards. You know, there's no bunkers on the left. You know, there's a bunkers on there's bunkers on the right. Um, you know, I, there's, of course there's deep rough and, and things of that nature, but that is really what didn't present me with any issues. And maybe that's the reason, you know, had they, uh, you know, had we been playing, say the 18th at Doral or say the 18th here at FedEx St. Jude Classic with, with water short and left, you know, there might've been a little bit more of a thought process involved in, in where exactly I needed to play. But again, the yardage was perfect. 
um, it, it was a yardage that if I miss hit my seven iron just a little bit, uh, it still carries the front. If I if I really catch a, a, a flyer or or just a drilling catches me, I'm not going to be able to hit it over the green because there was another, I don't know, I guess another six or seven probably behind the flag. Uh, the number was just absolutely perfect. So there weren't a lot, like I said, there weren't a whole lot of things for me to think about. It was just a matter of getting the ball from point A to point B. And with none of those things in my way, hazards, water, sand, it was just the perfect opportunity for me to go for the flag. And yeah. uh, and that's what I did. And I and I because there was I, I felt like even where the flag was, it was kinda in a safe position. So there was no reason not to play for it. Right. So take me through the double eagle at the the six hole at Pebble Beach, you know, no less in the in the two thousand ten US Open. Did were you able did you see the ball go in the hole or was it the crowd no, reaction no, that let that, you know it was in? Yes, it was. And that was really cool. I mean, of all the things that I've done, I mean you know, obviously the the win there at Oak Hill uh, is kind of on top of this, but it was really cool. I mean, I was we were playing and I was playing okay. You know, I'd, I'd held the lead the first day of the U.S. Open, and I was leading through about nine holes of the second day when a really unfortunate incident happened, and between me and Graham McDowell, who eventually won the tournament, it was really unfortunate. But but um, anyway, I was playing playing really well. VJ Singh and I were playing together, and he's up over on the right side and. And uh, I'm kind of in the middle of the fairway, and, I, and and we're sitting there, and I think I had 230 to the front, and the pin was on nine. And for anybody that's been there or watched it, you know, you know how sixth hole, it, it's you, your tee shot kind of sits down in a, a little level area, and then you got to hit up on top of the plateau, which is probably 30, 40 feet above the the bottom of the sixth first part of the fairway. And you, know, you kind of see the flag up there blowing, and you pick a club, and you know, you just aim up there. I mean, you know, you're just trying to get it up on top of the plateau because as firm as it was, it was going to roll. So I think club selection is is always, you know, was always kind of the number one priority. And I just, I pulled the three iron. You know, the three iron was going to carry about 210, and it was going to run as firm as it was playing. It was going to run 20 or 30 yards, and that's, that's just trying to make birdie. I hit the shot up there. It was online, and I didn't really think too much about it and started bouncing, and I hear the crowd. And then the crowd just let out this tremendous roar. And, um, you know, and so I gave my caddy a high five. And, you know, I didn't I didn't get a seat to go in, so it was kind of anticlimactic. But, you know, what was cool about it is that Stephanie was there again. You know, she was there for me at Oak Hill in 03, and then, and then she was there following me around the U.S. Open in, uh, in, in well, I guess, 2010. And, uh, you know, I got the ball out of the hole and I walked over and I gave it to her. And that was, I gave the, even though that was Father's Day Sunday, you know, my mom was really in her final stages of life at that point. You know, she died in October of that year of cancer. And so she kept the ball for me. And uh, when I got home, I just made this really nice frame for her and I put, um, you know, something, uh, you know, relating to her and, um, kind of the date, the time that I hit the shot and where it was. And I had this really nice plaque made for my mom. Even though it was on Father's Day, I gave it to her. And um, and then when she passed away, my dad gave it back to me. So, it, it, you know, it, it's been kind of tough. You know, I see that uh, every once in a while. But uh, anyway, it was just, it was a really cool moment. It was, it really was. And I, um, I promptly, I, so, I, so I make double eagle on six. I made double bogey on the shortest hole on the planet on number seven, and then I birdied eight, <laughs> which is one of the toughest holes in golf. So it was, um, you know, it was going from elation to to just being angry, an angry man on the golf course to then making birdie. And I think I ended up finishing like 21st or 22nd that year in the U.S. Open, which, yeah. you know, was exciting. It, it really was. I mean, especially after leading the first day to, to kind of, you know, I kind of had to run the gamut of that U.S. Open, and uh, with the with the <laughs> with the great shots and the double bogeys and stuff like that. So it was a uh, it was another memorable tournament for me. So we've got our next guest, Kenny Knox, hanging on the line. We're going to get to Kenny in just a minute, Sean. Just a couple more before we let you go. Now you sort of teased us with the incident with Graham McDowell, and be, you know, based on what we've seen. You know, uh, over the last couple of weeks with some, you know, potential run-ins on, on the golf course, I'm curious, you know, yeah. pique our interest, got to be curious. What happened? 
Well, I'll be quick. You know, on the first hole, we had made the turn. We started on the back, and um, I think I shot 69. So I was two under the first day, and I came around. I think I was even par for the round. So I'm still two under for the tournament, tied with maybe Graham and somebody else. Well, you know, number one, I, the the, uh, the pin was on the kind of the front right, kind of mid front, yeah, front right over there. And um, I missed, a, I hit a wedge into the green, and it kind of had skipped off and rolled off to the right. Well, I get up there, I thought it was in the track, in the bunker, front right bunker. <clears throat> well, the way they had that golf course set up that week was this really long, kind of wispy grass that that was, uh, it kind of was around the bunkers and and everything else. It was real brown, and and there was a lot. Of, there were, of course, there was a lot of green to it too. Well, my ball, instead of going into the bunker, had rest come to rest on top of this really thick. Uh, kind of fescue grass that was laying over the bunker. So my ball was almost suspended over the bunker. I mean, there was really nothing underneath it. There was a little bit of soil underneath, and then the rest of it was sand. And we're just kind of like, you know, how in the world did this ball stay here? And right. anyway, so I get up there, and the only, really the only way to hit the shot was to kind of hit like a, a semi-bunker shot, kind of a blast shot. Well, I hit this ball, I swung, and the ball went about four feet. And it went straight, you know, straight in front of me. Well, as soon as I hit it, I thought, wow, that's kind of weird, you know. It didn't – and Graham and his caddy, Kenny, ran over, and they're like, you double hit that, you double hit that. And I'm like, what are you talking about double hit that ball? I didn't double hit that. I only hit it once. You know, you think of a guy when he double hits one, you you watch it where a guy gets gets stuck in the the rough and his club accelerates and hits it or something like that, and the ball goes – 20, 30 right. yards. Well, this ball just basically went straight in front of me about four feet, right in line with the flag. And so now that throws me off, you know, and I'm and I'm kind of upset. I'm really kind of ticked, actually. I'm like, well, I only hit the ball one time. Well, Mike Davis came out, you know, we, we're having to finish on the, the ninth hole, which is way out. So Mike comes out, he's, he's like, look, just sign your card for what for what the number you think you made on the hole. We'll go back and we'll go into the truck and then we'll look at it. And, I'll, and if if you decide that there's a penalty, we'll, you know, we'll, um, you know, we'll let you change it without. It won't count against you. Know you won't be disqualified for signing an incorrect scorecard. Well, I, right after that, I make a bogey on the next hole, and then I think I made a double bogey on the hole after that. So I go from now I'm leading the U.S. Open to basically being thankful that there's only a few holes left in the, left in the round, and I think I shot seven. Right. I think I shot 76, and I think I had to sign for 77. And we went into the truck. I looked at it, and Mike's like, look, Sean, I don't know what you did. I, it, it really looks funny, but I don't understand. It doesn't look like a double hit. And I said, well, look, Mike, I only made contact with – I only felt contact with the ball one time. And he went on to explain that, you know, it was possible to make to make contact with the ball twice, with to hit the ball twice without only impacting it once. So that's got my mind going. And I think what had happened, and there was really no great camera angle. There was one that was kind of straight behind the green. And I think what we kind of determined was that when I swung and I hit the hit the grass behind the ball, like playing an explosion shot, all of the grass in front of the ball stood straight up. The ball then seemed to repel off of the grass and hit my club face. And that's exactly kind of what it looked like. And even after we looked at it, Mike said, Sean, I'm fine if you don't want to take a penalty here. I, I, it looks funny, but I, I, it, I can't, I can't tell. And and so that's kind of what, after thinking through it, and just and, and basically watching the video, and, and that's the only explanation that we came up with. And I decided that since you know Mike had basically told me that you know you can double hit the ball while only making you know contact once, I think that's just in fact kind of what happened. But the, the situation with Graham, it just really kind of ticked me off in the beginning because, you know, it didn't take any time for that ball to stop and only move four feet for him to kind of come over and say, you double hit that. And I just was kind of like, okay, um, you know, maybe not a good time to, to, to bring that up, but that's what happened. And, um, you know, I like Graham and, and all that, but, I mean, that's really kind of stuck with me. And even if it, it yeah. if it was right, it just the, the way that it happened. Um, you know, I'm sitting there going, "What the heck? Just what was that? You know, shot? I just dust this ball?" And um, anyway, it just it, it wasn't as bad really as some of the situations because I didn't really have a whole lot to say because I was still as confused as anybody else. And the other playing partner in our group, Rocco Media, he was like, "Man, what, 
what was that? <laughs> so he didn't think it was a double hit either, but it it just turned out that it, it was probably probably what had happened. So, uh, you know, those types of things happen out there. I mean, guys aren't yeah. uh, there aren't looking they're, people aren't looking for you to make a mistake, um, and they're not looking to f- to find some way that you've cheated the game. But um, in that instance, it just it just it just didn't set well with me the way that the way it all happened. You are exempt to play in the PGA Championship until you're 65. So uh, we get the opportunity to look forward to seeing you out there here in a in a couple of months. Are you looking forward to playing and getting back out there? I am. I am. You know, I, I really like Whistling Straits. I mean, we've been very fortunate the last couple played there. 04 is where I defended there. Um, we played there in, in 10. Um, we've been. We haven't had a whole lot of bad weather. Uh, not, not not a lot of high wind. And so, yes, I mean, every day that I go out and practice, you know, I really have been thinking about that one event because that's the one event that I know for the next few months that I'm going to be playing. So um, I do. I, I just made my hotel reservation there at the American Club. It's a beautiful little town. Uh, it, it's just the history of how he built the golf course with Pete Pete Dye and the amount of uh, truckloads of dirt that they moved. Um, it's just a beautiful piece of property. and. You know, it's really a unique setting. And for anybody that's never been up there, take a chance. Go up there. I mean, you've got great golf courses to play, a great little town. Uh, it's a great championship. They do a great job with food. And then the, the champion's dinner is so great there. Um, it's a unique place uh, with the sheep roaming around on the course and everything else. It's a it's a really cool place. And to think that that exists in the United States um, is uh, really an architectural uh, dream. And uh, the, the vision that he must have had – to have come up with a property like this. Now, look, I'm 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 saying that now, but you ask me that after when I'm up there playing. I mean, ask Jim Johnson <laughs> that, you know, and what happened to him in 2010. So there are there are some quirky quirky parts about the golf course, but as far as you know, being inside all of that, I mean, it's just a beautiful piece of property. To think that somebody could actually design that and and see their vision come to reality is is remarkable. It really is. That's great stuff. John, you know we're we're in your corner. We can't thank you enough for the friendship and uh, and how great you've been uh, you know to us here on the show. Thank you for joining me again this morning. It's uh, always such a privilege getting to talk to you. Yeah, me too, Chris. I enjoy being on with you as well. All right, John. Continued success. Hopefully, we get to see you uh, out there on uh, one of the tours here between now and uh, and Whistling Straits. If not, uh, we look forward to hopefully catching up with you afterwards and hearing all about your uh, experience playing out there. That sounds great. All right, Chris. Thanks so much. All right. Take care, Sean. Okay. Sean McKeel, 2003 PGA champion. What a great guy. I always enjoy having Sean as part of the show. All right. Now back with me on the Seymour Putters guest line is Kenny Knox. Let me remind you about Kenny's background. He's not. Uh, he's he's from uh, not too far down the road from me here in Atlanta, down in Columbus, Georgia. He attended Florida State University and was an All-American his senior season. Kenny won three times out on the PGA Tour at the 1986 Honda Classic, the 87 Hardy's Golf Classic, and the 1990 Buick Southern Open. He is also one of the best putters of all time. In 1989, he set three putting records at the MCI Heritage Classic. He had eight putts over nine holes, 18 putts for the round, so 18 putts over 18 holes and 93 putts over the 72 holes. He is currently teaching golf in Tallahassee, Florida, and I am very honored that, A, he was patient with me, and he is next on the tee with me again this morning. Good morning, Kenny. Thanks for being here. Good morning, Chris. Good to hear from you. So, Kenny, before we start talking about your playing career, update us on what you've been up to and how things are going at Kenny, uh, Kenny Knox Golf. Well, it's all about the putters right now, Chris. I've really been... Uh accelerating uh, the company. We're really moving forward with that. We're, we've got uh, 24 new uh, models of putts that can be found on my website, the KennyKnoxGolf.com website. They're, we call them a transformer. They're very interesting. I've got a, a, a direct aim fitting system that I use where I can, I can actually determine which putter someone uh, actually lines up the best out of out of all the different models. So what I did was I took uh, I've got uh, and I got heel shafted, center shafted, right handed and left handed, and then we have four different hosel configurations: uh, straight in, uh, offset S curve, and plumber's neck, 
and then we've got the uh, the double bend. And so I'm able to interchange and actually make 12 right-handed putters and 12 left-handed putters using the transformer system. And so I go to the fitting system where I can interchange the heads with the different hosel configurations, determining which putter the individual actually lines up the best. It's an incredible way. You know, everybody's all about fitting uh, shafts with drivers and irons and everything. Well, I found my niche with the putters. So now you can have a putter that actually uh, fits your eye according to the way that you line up. Because, you're, all, for instance, if you have a, a no-offset center-shafted putter, I can determine that the odds are most people are going to line that up to the left. So then I would put them into an offset putter. And so that would get them back to the target. Now, if you line up to the right, the odds are you're probably using an offset putter. And so and then I no offset putter and get them back uh, on target with that. There's about 5% of the people that I fit. Uh, I was with Jack Nicholas about three months ago, and he's in my 5% club. Every putter that I fit him for, that I had him line up for me, he lined up dead on the target. So that kind of gives you a little idea of why he was such a great putter and made all those great putts under the pressure. So is he using one of your putters now? Well, his, uh, his son, Jack, he's using one. He used it in the father-son. And Jack, I laughed when he said, yeah, send me a putter. So I actually delivered it to him. He came up to a Florida State football game. Uh, my wife and I met he and Barbara at the airport, and I presented him the putter. And, and uh, we went to the football game together. And then he got back on his jet and flew home, and then he was playing in the uh, father-son. And he did not use the putter. I was laughing because I said, Jack, you're never going to use a putter with somebody else's name in it. That's crazy. But Jackie fell in love with the putter that I fit him for. I fit him for a center shafted offset putter. He fell in love, and he's been using it ever since. Ah, that's great. Good for you. You know, Kenny, when uh, when I've been out on your site recently, you've got some great videos on KennyKnoxGolf.com. Oh, thank you. You, you, say, you say good technique eliminates bad nerves and like i was talking with sean McKeel and you know with so many other guys in the past kenny you know golf is so much you know what is played between the five inch space between our ears right so, so some of the things that you show for both long putts and 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 the three to four foot knee knockers what what are some things for for, for us weekend golfers that you know when we are out there you know, whether it's we're trying to lag a long putt and get it close or knock in those three to four footers, what are some things that you recommend that we do to keep in mind and to, you know, get that ball close to the hole or in? Well, you know, for the short putts, I mean, for everything, it's all the same, actually. There's three things that go along with putting. You know, first of all, alignment. You must learn how to line up the, the, the putter correctly to your intended target. The second thing, once you get lined up properly, is mechanics. And so the mechanics in the golf stroke, you never want to have to make compensations in your stroke to square the face up and impact. That's the ultimate goal of once you line up correctly, you just want to square club face and impact so the ball will start on the correct line. So, yeah, mechanics. And the third thing is trust. Once you line it up correctly and you know that your mechanics are sound, then it's very easy to trust your stroke. And so what I recommend and what I teach is all about just rocking your shoulders, maintaining the unit between your shoulders, your arms, your hands, and the putter head. So as you set the club down, you created a unit with uh, shoulders, arms, hands, and putter head. And then at that point, you just want to rock your shoulders and take your hands out of the stroke. You don't ever want to have to make compensation in your stroke. And so the way that we do that is all about connection. You need to keep that putter connected to your fixed point at your bo- in your body. Where I like to point the end of the putter a grip is at just in front of my belt buckle, so I have a slightly forward press in my when I start my stroke. Okay, so as I take the putter back, just rocking my shoulders, taking my hands out of it, that putter is always pointed at that fixed point in your body, whether it's four inches or five inches. That distance between the end of the putter and that fixed point in your body never changes, and so it goes back and it's four to five. It comes back to impact. It's perfectly square, four to five inches away from your body. And then as you rotate your shoulders or rock your shoulders, the putter stays four to five inches away from your body. If you watch all the great putters, the Tiger Woods, who's made more putts than anybody and was 
you know, historically, he's been the greatest putter of all time. You watch his stroke, the putter is aimed at that fixed point in his body, and it never moves. Okay, so all he's doing is maintaining that unit between his shoulders, arms, hands, and putter head, and just simply rocking his shoulders. Now, where we get off is, is when we let first, and the hands don't move, then all of a sudden the putter head, the, the end of the putter at the grip end, is now pointed away from that fixed point. And so at that point, then you have to make stroke to get the putter face back to squared impact, correct? So let's just keep it simple, fix that point, and that's why the belly putters were so good and actually took the nerves out of the stroke. Most people, the problem is they use their hands in putting, and that's where the nerves come in. If you can learn to take your hands out of the stroke by maintaining that connection that I've just described and that you can see on the website when you go to my videos on my KennyKnoxGolf.com website, you'll see how easy it is to just maintain uh, the connection in your uh, stroke. So, therefore, a short putt is no different than a long putt. The one thing you have to be aware of is your transition. As you take the putter back, you never want to rush your transition. And so you have to trust that just by rocking your shoulders, you can feel your speed properly in your backstroke and your through stroke. So the transition meaning the direction change from the back to the forward stroke, most people rush that transition, which is going to open up the putter face at impact. When that putter face is open, the ball is going to start to the right, you're going to lose your line. So, therefore, uh, you're never going to make the putt unless you misread it correctly or incorrectly. <laughs> right. So, you know, or get lucky. So, you know, the other thing is I've developed a putter with face technology that makes up for a lot of – most people break down at impact and add loft at impact. So if they're using a putter that has four degrees loft – at the address position, and they're breaking down at impact, they're actually adding loft at impact. So that loft goes from 4 degrees to 6 or 7 degrees, who knows how much. That's the launch angle. So the way to determine that is you'll see the ball will fly in the air and hit and start bouncing, and then eventually it will start rolling. So if you don't have a roll board, then you can go – let's say early in the morning when there's dew on the ground, and you can hit some putts. And I recommend hitting 20 to 30-foot putts so that you can see how far the ball flies and when it hits the ground, how much it bounces before it starts rolling. Well, with my technology, I have zero degrees loft at the bottom of the putter face and three degrees at the top of the putter face. So it makes up for that added loft of impact. In other words, when you add loft of impact, you go from zero degrees with my putter to around two, two and a half degrees or a normal uh, stroke. So therefore, you're at the optimum launch angle of two, two and a half degrees. What I tell people, if you've used a four-degree putter your whole life and you roll the ball good where the ball stays on the ground, that's fantastic. That is what Dave Stockton teaches, who is one of the four most putting teachers in the world at this time. Right. And so, But the thing is, you're having to make that compensation in your stroke, and we're looking for consistency in our stroke. So, therefore, you go from zero degrees at the bottom of my putter to three degrees at the top. And so, if you are de in the putter, you go from three degrees to two degrees. All right? So, I tell people, if you're going to use a four-degree lofted putter, top to bottom, then you're going to need to go see Dave Stockton to learn how to putt. And he can teach you. I promise you. He's great. But, <laughs> if you want to make up your compensation in your stroke, you can use my putter and go from zero to two degrees at impact by adding two degrees loft at, at impact. Or if you want to de-loft the putter at impact, having the hand slightly ahead of the ball in your stroke, you go from three degrees to two degrees at impact. So it makes up for the human era. So to that point, Kenny, um, are you, A, an advocate of the forward press, and, B, if you're already doing the forward press and you use, and you went to your 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 putter, you really don't need to do that because because of how your your putter blade is offset. It's all about what happens at impact. Okay, you can forward press all you want at a dress, but you may back out of it. A lot of people put the weight on their back foot at a yeah. dress, and I advocate weight on your front foot, your forward foot, the one closest to the hole. 
so that you have a little bit more of a level stroke, a little more descending at impact rather than hitting up on the ball so much. So I advocate, what I advocate is maintaining the unit and maintaining that connection in your stroke so that you can return the putter back to square at impact without having to make compensation in your stroke. I like to have a slight forward press because what I found when your hands are back, see, there's three things that can happen in your stroke that get you offline, okay? If your shoulders are open, then your elbows or your forearms are uh, what I call over the top. Your right side of your right-handed putter is over the top of the left. So, therefore, the putter face is going to be uh, closed. If the ball's up in your stance, the putter face could be closed, okay? So, if your shoulders are uh, open and your ball is up in your stance, and your hands are the three things that allow you to line up to the left or make you line up to the left. So I can correct someone's stroke and the way they set up to it in, in one, one stroke of the putt just simply by lining them up correctly with square shoulders, square hips, uh, neutral ball position, and, and the hands in the neutral position. So just by making those simple adjustments in your lineup, you can line up correctly to the to the, your intended target. Now, my tendency was always to uh, have my hands back a little bit because I like less loft, so I would de-loft my putters on the tour and go from four degrees to two degrees. So what happened, Chris, <laughs> by doing that, that opens up the putter face. I know I'm getting really technical here, but you can follow all this all on right. my website. And so when you, when you take loft off of a club, it opens it up. And when you add loft, it closes it. So... I always would take loft off my putters, loft from my putters. I would try to get two degrees, but that opened up the putter face. So when I designed my putters, my new Knox golf putters, they all designed perfectly square with the perfect loft, uh, loft on it from zero to three degrees top to bottom. So you no longer have to put your hands back to get that two degrees loft after taking the loft off because you've got it at a dress wherever you put your hands. So what I found when you asked me if I prefer getting back to your original question, your hands forward, uh, only for me because what that does is it gets my putter face square to my intended target. So, Kenny, one, one of the things you, you just mentioned in there is, is about ball position. When we're, on, when we're set up over the ball to, to, you know, to make our stroke, where do, you want, where do you typically want ball position? I've heard you, know, you want it inside the left heel, you want it forward in your stance, you want it in the middle. What do you prefer? What do you think is the best ball position for us? Okay, well, I just gave Bernard Langer a, a putting lesson last week at the TPC, and we talked about ball position because he was having trouble with getting the ball started on the proper line. In my opinion, there's only three ball positions, and it's really easy. If you'll take three golf balls and set them up in a row, one, two, three. Now, the first golf ball, the one closest to the hole, will set up on your left toe, assuming you're a right-handed putter. Okay? The second ball position, they're, and they're back-to-back-to-back. To back to back. The second ball position will be inside. And then the third ball position is going to be your zipper. Now, think Hang on, about we just this. Lost you. We, lost, we lost your audio there for just a second. Your first ball position is up front. Where was the second ball position? Okay, if you put the balls back-to-back-to-back, to back to back, your first right. ball position is going to be off your left toe. Right. All right, your second ball position is going to be on your left, uh, off your left heel, inside heel. All right, and then okay. the third ball position is going to be on your zipper. So the balls go back to back to back. So there's three different ball positions that I use. I like to put my feet shoulder width apart. Okay, so width apart, uh, and so that my ball position, left toe, uh, left heel, or zipper. Those are the three ball positions. Now, as I was talking to Bernard last week, I helped him understand that when the ball position is up in your stance, where's the putter face going to be? It's going to make you uh, have a clo- little bit of a closed putter face because, again, you're, that's going to open up your shoulders and it's going to open up your forearms where you're over the top with your right side. All right, so let's go. So I'll hit a putt, and the putt, will, you know, it's all about path. Now the putter will go straighter back. It will actually go straight back, and then as it gets back to impact, the putter face is slightly closed at impact. Okay? So the ball will start left of the hole. All right? So now we go to a neutral position. Now 
Now, watch what happens. Your punter face is square now. Right? Your arms are you're square to your intended target, and your shoulders are square to your intended target. As you take the putter back, the putter face, the putter will actually go on the inside. And then as it returns back to square, the putter face will be square, and the ball will start on a straight path. All right, now let's go one more ball back. Now all of a sudden, your shoulders are closed. The putter face is open to your intended target. And as you rotate your shoulders back, we're going a much more inside path. And then when you, as you return back to the golf ball, the putter face is going to be open, and the ball is going to start to the right of your intended target. All right, so why would you ever want to start the ball left, and why would you ever want to start to the right of your intended target? Okay, so what I teach is if I have a left to right breaking putt, then I want the ball up in my stance because I'm from the high side of the hole, correct? Right. You're, gonna, you're never going to make any putts on the low side of the hole. You're always going to make them on the high side of the hole. All right? You follow me? With you. So if I, if I have a straight putt or just a slightly breaking putt, it's on my left heel. That's a, if my putt's breaking right to left, I'm going to back the ball up in my stance. So when I, the putter returns back to impact, the path is going to stay on the uh, the ball's going to stay on the high side of the hole. It can all be explained on my on my website. I hope that uh, someone can <laughs> learn from that. There you go, Kenny. You've also you've also done uh, not not only a great job you know, with uh, being a great putter in your putting line, but you've also done some wedges. Are you still looking? Are you still creating the, the wedges at Kenny Knox Golf? Yeah, I'm actually. Uh, the 56, and the 60. Now, I've sold out of the 60, so those are going to be reordered. Uh, actually, I, I went in with Jose Maria Olathabo. He has a, ch- a line of wedges in, in Europe called the Chima line, and he actually designed my wedges, two times Masters champion. So I've done a great job designing these wedges. They're beautiful. Now, the one of the great things about these wedges is the way that we design uh, the bottom bounce of the, of the club. Uh, Sevy Balceres obviously was a friend of Jose's, Maria's, but but he was also a friend of mine. He taught me how to grind my. We ground these wedges with with what I call heel roll and toe roll, a uh, toe roll bounce. So that brings the center of gravity uh, to the middle of the wedge and brings it up the put, uh, up the wedge face. So therefore, when you make uh, impact with a golf ball, the golf ball uh, is actually going to be uh, more in the center of the club and not off the, ho- uh, the toe of the heel. And, so, and it will stay on the face a little bit longer, which is what you want. So the center of gravity actually is more to the middle and up the face. Now, uh, they come in bounces. The 52 has a 8-degree bounce. The 56 has 12 degrees bounce. And the 60 degree has 8 degree bounce. They are chrome, uh, a stainless finish with the 303 stainless steel, and they're a natural finish. So when you receive them, they're absolutely beautiful. They look like chrome, very shiny. And then as you take the package off and you start handling them and using them, they will tarnish and uh, I hate to say rust, but they will definitely turn that rust color. And what that natural finish does for you is makes the, the wedge more playable uh, around the grains. It's not as hard. It's much softer. And the ball stays in the club face longer, and you can hit more shots with it. And they are USGA-conforming uh, grooves as well. So uh, the wedges are fantastic. I had a great response with the wedges. And uh, I've got to, I just got to get some more 60s in it because they sold out so fast. So and to to your point, right? You want it to actually turn that rust color, right? That's not that's not a sign of bad things, and it's time to replace it. You want it to sort of tarnish a little bit, correct? Yeah. You still with us, Kenny? You know we've we've struggled a little bit with uh, with uh, Kenny. So Kenny, you still there? I think we finally. We actually lost Kenny, but great stuff at KennyKnox.com. Again, you know he's got a great line of putters. The uh, the wedges, to his point, the 60s being out of stock, but uh, uh, great videos on KennyKnox.com. And uh, you know for 
help, you know, making more putts and lining yourself up and then uh, seeing some great tips from a guy who is one of the great short game players of, uh, of all time. Uh, you need to go out there and check it out. He's got so much great content on there. We thank Kenny for being a part of the show uh, this morning. Hopefully we have an opportunity to catch up with Kenny again real soon. All right, before we close up shop this morning, folks, I want to remind you about a great book from our friends, as he mentioned, Dave Stockton, our great friend Dave Stockton and Dave Stockton Jr., their book called Own Your Game. If you're starting to get uh, getting ready and getting the rust off yourself, right, starting to, you know, for our friends up in the Northeast who struggled so long with the cold, right, getting out there finally, remember, so much of the game, like we've talked about this morning with Kenny and with Sean, is played in that five-inch space between our ears. Get your mind right. And this latest book, The Stocktons, lets you know how to use your mind to play winning golf, right? Own Your Own Game uh, recreates the experience of riding 18 holes with Dave Stockton at one of his highly sought-after corporate outings and draws from his experience as a Champions Tour player and a revered coach. He shows you how to think better, stay calmer, and execute more consistently, and most importantly, how to enjoy the game more thoroughly. Go to StocktonGolf.com to get your copy, and for a couple extra dollars, he'll even autograph it for you. All right, everybody, it's time for me to put a bow on this episode. My sincere thanks once again to Sean McKeel and to Kenny Knox for joining me this morning and for making today's show so much fun to be a part of and so informative, really, on how to play better golf. We thank you for tuning in. You know we appreciate you the very most. Please check out our sister show, Thursday Night Tailgate, or Thursday Night Tailgate with me and my ho- ho- uh, co-host, Bob Lazari, and our announcer, Joe LaGenusha. That show airs live every Thursday from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. You can find us on Blog Talk Radio as well as Armed Forces Radio as well. Plus, Friday nights, you can hear us from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time on BoostRadioNetwork.com. That show, like this one, is also available on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, Player.fm, Audio Boom. Great new, uh, fo- uh, some great new folks that have picked up the show, plus SoundCloud as well. Uh, we're joined every single week on Thursday Night Tailgate uh, by you know stars and legends from around the NFL and the CFL. Please also check out both shows on Facebook. Give us a like. That's important to us, too. You can find us online, nextonthetea.net for this show and thursdaynighttailgate.com as well. You can stream or download any of our archive episodes for free and keep up to date with who our future guests are going to be on both sites. Thank you again for choosing to listen to the show today. We appreciate you the very most. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends.